Welcome to Perfectly Paranormal, Episode 5. My name's Anna Schmidt, and I'm here every week to share with you true paranormal encounters and information about devils, demons, and dark energy beings that no one else talks about. So this week, we're talking about the ways that dark energy beings move around in the environment. We're going to kick off today with a tale from 2015 of a real, live demon hunter living in the suburbs who wanted to go part-time. The Demon Hunter's Dilemma So I received a call from Quite an agitated man one afternoon. Now we're going to call this man Jerry. I always change people's names for confidentiality reasons. Now Jerry lived locally and he pleaded with me to visit his home because he was being plagued by demonic beings day and night. So as I got in the car and drove to Jerry's house and I turned into the street, I could feel a paranormal pulse in that street. And as I got closer to Jerry's home, I instantly knew that these pulsating blasts of negative energy were emanating from Jerry's house. I could see and feel what I can only describe as just dense energy, just swirling energy around the building. And one of my classic signs now for defining uh, dark energy presence is a really sudden cough. One of those really dry, hacking coughs that, that kind of come out of nowhere. And this is what I developed instantly as I pulled into his driveway. So as I turned off the engine of the car and I, I sat there putting my keys away, I kind of suddenly looked up because I felt like I was being watched. And there was this man standing at the front window, staring at my car. It was quite unnerving. It was like something out of one of those horror movies. And he disappeared and reappeared at the front door. And he was there before I'd even got out of the car. And he's standing there watching me again. And I was a little bit creeped out, but I thought, no. Told Jerry I would come and check out his house, so I'm going to do it. As I approached the house, he silently signalled me to enter, and we walked into his sort of small kitchen and sat at the table in the corner. Jerry sat down very quietly and looked at me, and the first words that passed his lips were, I'm a demon hunter. And he observed me and waited to see what my response would be. And in my mind, I instantly knew that this man was troubled in more ways than one. He continued on with a very long, dramatic story about his life and how he was born a demon slayer and deals with dark entities day and night, seven days a week. And he's tired of this constant inconvenience, as he called it. I listened carefully, sort of building a picture of this man's long-term paranormal addiction in my mind. I've dealt with a lot of people with paranormal addiction. I can usually tell by the way people write emails or the way they talk about their stories. There's a difference between, I'm really, really good now at telling the difference between Paranormal addiction with mental health issues and someone who has something in their house that just needs moving out. There's very defined differences in the way that people communicate. But back in the day, in 2015, I hadn't had that much experience with people with paranormal addiction like I do now. And quite often with people like Jerry, I would suggest very strongly that they see a mental health professional see their medical doctor, get themselves on track. Then I will come back and do an energetic clearing of the home if it's still needed. Let's get back to the story. So 
I'm sitting there at Jerry's table and I'm listening really carefully to him. And he's giving me that long-winded story. When suddenly he announced that he still wanted to be a demon slayer, but only part-time. On Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'll never forget it. I've remembered that for quite a long time now. I didn't know what to say. So I kind of sat there silently looking at him in astonishment as he smiled and he sipped his coffee, pleased with his part-time work plan. So while seated at the table, my spidey senses, as I call them sometimes, were starting to pick up shifts in the energy of the room. And I knew we weren't alone. Paranormal beings will often observe people that come into homes and they'll make up in their mind whether this person's a threat or this person's just visiting. Do I need to make myself known or do I just stay in the background feeding off whatever emotional imprints are in the home? But these beings decided that they needed to get close. Like the air went from being really clear and light to quite thick and dense. And I actually found it quite hard to breathe in the kitchen. And I felt the very sly approach of an invisible presence. Now, if you've ever felt this, like you know someone is walking up to you, but you just can't see them. I'm not great at seeing these beings. Occasionally I will get a vision, not usually. My feeling senses are my strong point when it comes to these paranormal beings. So it was very clear that there was more than one dark being in this kitchen and they were all observing me to see what my reactions would be, what my language would be like. These energetic beings read your energy body. We're all energy bodies in these physical forms. And they know where your ego runs. They know your habits, your behaviors. It's really hard to explain. I'm not one of them, so I can't really explain it 100%. I just do my best to share what I know with you. Now, they weren't happy that I was in Jerry's home because quite often house healers or house energy clearers, as I like to call myself, we, we get reputations of going into homes and moving beings out. Now, I do it respectfully. Not everyone does. And these people are the ones that give us a bad reputation. And just as in the earth realm, there's the gossip vine, so there is in the darker realms. So some of these beings get their knickers in a twist before they've even met you. They decide who you are and how you'll behave before they even get to know you. Okay, so if I knew back then what I know now about paranormal beings and addiction to the supernatural, I would have advised Jerry about the dangers of interfering with the dark realms and referred him very quickly to see a mental health professional, like I mentioned before. But no, in the early days, I just wanted to help people. And I thought, you know, I should be able, I'll be able to do something to help make the energy of Jerry's home better and he can go part time. Oh my gosh. So I got involved. And this case was another one of those cases that is a major turning point in my understanding of dark and demonic level beings. So I went through many paranormal experiences with Jerry over the next three months, and none of them were good. I had destructive entities coming into my home day and night, frightening the dog, affecting my sleep, my dreams, my mental functioning. And my energy levels, which were pretty much wavering near zero, no matter what I did, no matter how healthy I ate, I just had no energy because these beings are energy drainers and we are literally energetic batteries for them. I was attempting to change the status quo in Jerry's home and they didn't like it. These beings chose to hit me with every energetic attack that they could think of to keep me away from the house. And there is a reason why they did this, and I will be sharing it as we go through the story. So I was at a standstill. I had exhausted, over those three months, every single tool in my paranormal clearing kit, as I call it. 
and I still couldn't change his home's continuous dark and demonic situation. So the turning point for me with this case happened after returning from Jerry's home one afternoon. I was again sitting at my kitchen table, sort of contemplating, you know, ideas and processes and methods that I could use to help Jerry when, above my head, on the kitchen wall, a horned and hooved being attempted to enter the space over my kitchen table through what I can only describe as a shimmering portal doorway. Like this, I could see this. Like I said before that I don't see paranormal energy. This was very clearly defined. They wanted me to know that they were watching. And so the hot air and the sparks, which kind of blew out of this interdimensional doorway, I was stunned. You know, I'm sitting there, I'm looking up, and I am seeing this long black horn and a cloven foot, which was attempting to enter into my house. It was like a rip in time, like you see in the movies. This was one of the freakiest things I have ever seen. Now, as I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh my God, I've got to do something. I I have to do something. I have to say something. So I kind of snapped out of that sort of staring, awkward gaze. And in a very bold, commanding voice, I demanded that this dark presence leave my home. And the darker realms sending what I now know to be a legion general to deliver the message, told me very loud and very clear that I needed to disconnect from Jerry altogether. Because I was not working on any other cases at the time. Jerry had my full attention. And the darker realms were watching. Okay, now they didn't harm me. They knew that I was fulfilling a contract between myself and Jerry. He'd employed me to do this work, but there was underlying factors that I didn't know about. And this was the first case where I was unable to help a client and it wasn't any fault of my own. Now, Jerry had created this ongoing situation over many, many years. And he'd drawn his family into it as well. Now, his family didn't live with him, but they all classed themselves as demon slayers. And they'd go on these demon slaying quests like something out of a video game. It's the only thing, it's the only way I can describe it. And I'm, I'm sitting here shaking my head going, what are these people thinking? Like, seriously, what are they thinking? So Jerry had created this situation. And it could only be transformed if he changed his ways. No matter what I did or what anyone else did, he'd created this intention to continuously profess to be a demon hunter and love slaying demons. When you put that kind of intention out there, you're going to get Every dark energy being in the vicinity, whether they're dark, demonic, legion, general, sub commanders, so many levels of dark energy that I've been shown, they're going to come and instigate warfare back at you, which is what it felt like in Jerry's home. The energy in Jerry's home was very dense, it was swirling, it was prickly, it was like there was electric currents sort of flowing through the air. It was very, very uncomfortable. I don't know how Jerry had lived like this until he must have been, I reckon, in his early 40s. Anyway, back to the story. So during my last visit to Jerry's home, I thought, how am I going to handle this situation? And I said to Jerry, I was very honest, and very straightforward, which is, that's my MO. That's how I work. No fluffy stuff from me. I just say it as it is. I said that the situation won't change unless he moved away from all paranormal interests and that he looked for alternative ways to fill his time. 
Jerry didn't work at that stage. And his holy, solely reason for living was as a demon hunter, a demon slayer. Seriously, he's got to get a hobby. He's got to get out there, get some training, get a job. Do something that makes you feel fulfilled in a safe way. And I also strongly suggested that he see a mental health professional to get his mental health on track. Because he had what I called paranormal addiction, 24 hours a day, it's all he thought about. So when I got home, I sat at my kitchen table with my eyes shut and I had a conversation with the darker realms. Because I know they're always listening. So I explained that I did not have the whole story regarding Jerry's situation and I humbly, humbly apologised for interfering in the first place. Now, that night, after making that very simple apology, made a big difference. My sleep and my energy levels returned to normal. My dog was more settled in the house. And most of all, there was no more visits from the horned being known as a Legion General. Now, I hope that story blew your mind. Like, seriously? There is so much we don't know about the paranormal world. And I get glimpses of Legion Generals quite often now. I'm going to do a whole podcast talking about the Legion General energies, but they are, as you can imagine, they're the commanders. They're the commanders of the ranking armies, as I call them. Fascinating, but I'm not going to go on about that now. If you like the content of this podcast, and don't want to miss any future episodes, please subscribe. And you can also share with your friends and get that message out there about these paranormal tricksters in our environment. I would really appreciate it. We have a question here from Kim, who lives in Brighton in the UK. And Kim asks, how do dark entities move around in the environment? So over my years of working with these beings, I've got probably about six or seven different methods that I can explain to you today. So one of the ways these beings move around the environment is from person to person, as if hopping from sort of host to host. If someone else comes along that has a better offering, as in a buildup of energetic imprints, then they're just going to move into the next person. Generally, it's through tears in people's auric fields because we all have an energy field around us. And sometimes there can be tears in that energetic field. I'm having problems with my throat today, as you may hear through this podcast. So I do apologize. But these beings affect me in a physical way. And quite often it's my voice that uh, bears the brunt. So I'm doing my best to make this podcast See, there I go again. Make this podcast as clear as possible for you. Back to what I was talking about. Now, another way these beings can move around is through what I call energetic cording. We have, as energy beings in these physical bodies, we have cording to anyone that you have an emotional attachment with. Friends, family, pets, workmates sometimes. and. Paranormal beings use these cords as a way of traveling between people. So you might do really, really good spiritual practices every morning. You do your protection, you do your meditation, which is great because you are protecting your energy field and you're connecting with high vibrational beings. But if you've got that cording to someone who's going through trauma or they've got huge buildups of emotional imprints or they've got uh, lower vibrational addictions like alcoholism, they're taking recreational drugs to extreme levels, then these people may be carrying paranormal beings who feed off those vibrations and they can come through that cording in to see what you've got. Because remember, they're just energetic feeders and they're just always on the lookout for a better food source. So people who use paranormal 
practices such as black magic practices through satanic practices, Ouija boards or going to seances are opening themselves up through intention. I've heard many a tale of people going to experiences where there's been Ouija boards and they've all sat around in the circle and they've gone through the process. They've opened the board, they haven't closed it properly and the doorway is left open. Now, whoever carries that board around with them, whether it sits in their home or in their car, it sits at work or at a friend's place, this doorway is open. It's just like the energy cords that I talked about between people, but it is an energy cord between an interdimensional place and where the board is. So just as I talked about Ouija boards being a doorway, there's also other interdimensional doorways that we call portals. Now they can be from this reality to another, they can be connected from this reality in one part of the world to another part of the world, and they are another sort of energetic superhighway that these beings use to travel around the environment. So sometimes these beings are present in locations where there has been a build-up of energetic imprints, or there may have been a trauma, or there may have been a car accident, or there may have been something that has happened. A friend and I were driving um, through the bush to a town, quite a few hours drive away, and we both suddenly got a headache in the middle of nowhere for no reason. And I said to my friend, I was driving, and I said to her, look, geez, I've got this pain on the left-hand side of my head. And she was sitting in the front passenger seat, and she said, yeah, I've got this headache on the right side of my head. She said, look, it was really sudden and really strong. And as we're talking about it, this headache stayed with us for, I don't know, about 10 Ks, and then it disappeared again. We talked about this quite extensively, and the only thing that we can come up with is that it was a paranormal presence on the roadside, or actually on the road where there had been an accident or a disturbance of some sort, and it had literally hitchhiked in the car, and it was sitting between the two of us, because I don't get headaches I'm not the headache sort of person. And I knew when I got this really pounding, sudden headache that, oh, there's something here. I didn't want to tell my friend because I didn't want to frighten her. And she was the same. She said to me, oh, I didn't want to say anything in case you thought I was making it up. And we just kind of laughed it off. But they will hitchhike sometimes. And it can be on the roadside. It can be in the movies because just they're anywhere, you know, they're in the supermarkets, in the theatres. I've quite often picked up energetic beings who are waiting for me down at the supermarket. And it's because of the work I do. They might want to transition into the healing space, or there could be spirits that are looking for someone to help them transition into the afterlife. And I'll be sitting here at my table where I work, and I'll hear in my head, I oh, need to go to the shop. And I'm like, no, I don't need to go to the shop. I'm, I'm doing this. You need to go to the shop. And if I don't do it, whoever's in my head, which is probably like a spirit guide or some sort of high vibrational helper, they can see what needs to occur. I need to actually go there. This being needs to hop into my space, come home with me, and then I can help them transition. So I'll go down to the shop and I'll think, oh, yeah, I need milk. I need this. I'll just get these things while I'm here. And as I'm rooming around the shop, I walk to the checkout and, oh, I can feel it standing at the checkout. It's so funny. While I'm, I'm moving through this space to pay for my things and the, the poor checkout person is looking at me like, are you okay? And I'm like, yes, I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> and my head has suddenly gone dizzy and I can't speak straight. I can't walk straight. I'm feeling quite sort of unwell, as I've talked about before in these podcast episodes. That They're my bodily signs. I get a lot of physical signs when these beings are around. And this being means me no harm. It has literally hopped into my energy field and decided that, yep, she's finally here. I want to transition, you know. So I came home from the supermarket that day and I sat at my table and I asked with my pendulum, is this a spirit? 
And I got, no. Is this a dark energy being? And again, I got my left to right diagonal signal, which is no. When I asked, is this a demonic level being? I got my clockwise circle, which is my yes with my pendulum. This being just sat there. It was so patient. I get told to go into all sorts of different shops and different places where I go. And I'm like, oh, here we go. But that's what I do for a job. It doesn't mean that you are going to pick up these beings when you go to the shop, but they do often use us as hitchhiking points. All right, I think I have covered all of the... The other thing I wanted to say is that as much as they can be at the local supermarket, they can hang around in homes, workplace buildings, historical buildings, where there have been build-ups of traumatic incidences. And then they may do the hitchhiking thing if someone comes along who has a better energetic uh, imprint that they like. So it's literally they hop around through us all the time. It's quite funny when you really think about it. I'm sorry if you don't think it's funny. It's not as frightening as what you have seen in the movies. So I hope you found this interesting today. In episode six, we have a question from Katie in Western Australia who writes in an email. Oh my gosh, she writes, Are you for real? What I do really challenges people. And I do my best to present my information, a non fear based approach. It's just about educating with a different perspective. So we're going to answer Katie's email and talk about belief systems and paranormal beings. And I'm also going to share a very relevant story to Katie's question, which I have called the spawn of Satan. Actually, I didn't name it. The lady in the story called me that. Uh, And you'll understand where that came from in episode six. So thank you for joining me today. And don't forget to send me your paranormal questions and your stories and any comments you have. You can email me at spiritualbeing44gmail.com. And for information about paranormal house clearing, you can visit my website, Spiritual Being, and I'll leave the web address in the description box. So I look forward to sharing this spooky space again with you next week. And remember, life is perfectly paranormal.